Well, I'm going to stand in front of you just for a few minutes. Hi, I'm Russell. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for coming. Welcome to Stencil Nation. Um, we've been talking a little bit. That's great. That's uh, one of the things I love about uh, doing this presentation and having the book is to just uh, come wander around, uh, wander around, uh, wander around the nation, wander around North America, maybe the world, and uh, get to talk to folks, get to share what I call the stencil love. Um, and uh, yeah, years ago when, when I started uh, my website, I have a website called stencilarchive.org. I started it in 2002. Um, it was, I tried to get a book published back then, and at the time there was only one book that was out called Stencil Graffiti by Tristan Manco. And uh, I got turned down two or three times, and I was like, you know, I'll just teach myself how to make a website and put all the photographs that I have on there. And I uh, started doing that, and I uh, made a business card for myself to promote the website, and I uh, had on there CSG, and, uh, and I started calling myself Certified Stencil Geek. And of course, there's no certification that I know of except for calling myself that. Um, but I'm a big fan of the art form. And uh, I saw my first stencil in 1990, around 1990 in South Carolina. It was Bob Dobbs, Church of Subgenius, uh, one of the more famous early 1980s uh, stencils. Uh, they had a book that came out back then. And they had a little, little stencil that you could photocopy and make bigger and then cut it out and then paint it around your neighborhood. And uh, of course, no one had digital cameras back then. So I, months later, I had my big heavy SLR uh, film camera, and I showed up, and it was gone. And that was uh, my first e experience in the impermanence of the art form. And uh, I'd just gotten out of, a, out of college with a history degree. And, when I, and, and I noticed them in 1995 in Europe. And then when I, when I arrived to San Francisco in 1997, they were just all over the place. And a lot of them had been there for years. A lot of them were fading away. Uh, of course, they get painted over. Property owners and uh, city government uh, sometimes don't like stencils or graffiti, and they paint over it. So, um, so I had my film camera for years and years and years wandering around San Francisco. And then whenever I traveled, uh, wandering the dirty, smelly alleyways of the, the urban spaces of the world, and uh, became quite a hunt, uh, a stencil hunt. And uh, I've since uh, thought about it in kind of uh, scientific terms uh, where uh, you know, you're, you're out in the jungle, you've got your safari hat on. But in this case, I've got my cool hip cap on, and I'm in the urban jungle. And I'm, I'm, I'm not hunting that elusive uh, monkey or bird up in the trees. I'm looking for that one random stencil on the wall or on the ground. Uh, and so as I started photographing them, I taught myself how to make them. Uh, it was very hard uh, to do at first. There was nothing on the internet, uh, no, no instructions, no how-to. Uh, you had to go, I had to go to the hardware store and look at the ducks and the floral patterns that people decorate their wallpaper around with. And they, they did it, you know, die cut. They probably had dies and big press machines that popped it out in the plastic. And try to figure it out that way. And uh, the first one I made was horrible. Uh, it fell apart. I spray, the spray paint was the wrong color on the sidewalk. And it was on a really thin piece of plastic that rolled up on itself and instantly destroyed itself. Uh, I had a group of, I uh, had a dance theater group standing behind me. It was celebrating the opening of their dance theater show. And when I pulled it off, they all just kind of leaned over and they were like, we can't really read it. What is, what is it? That kind of looks like. I was just like, uh. um, back to the drawing board. So, uh, so that's kind of my experience with, um, with learning how to make them. I do make them. I photograph them more than I make them. I find joy in discovering them out in the urban wild. Uh, so basically, this slide presentation is mostly a synopsis of the book. If you don't have the book already, this is uh, the teaser. This, uh, this will have some of the, the, the 450, 500 photographs that I have in the book. Uh, where you might see one photograph uh, from an artist in the book, I might have eight photographs. I might have four pages of the, of the artist's art. So uh, this is the teaser. This is the, the, the dog and pony show that gets you into the tent to pay the money for the real show, I guess. Uh, it lasts about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, uh, depending on uh, how much you want to talk about it, how much discussion you want to have. Feel free to jump in, ask questions. Uh, feel free, if you, if you know something that I don't know, feel free to jump in and talk about it. Um, it starts off with like kind of a, a stencil history 101, kind of a how-to 101, and then we go to the higher level courses, maybe the master courses, and basically that's just the, the photographs of the art itself uh, in the book. And what I'll do is I'll read a little bit for about the first six or seven slides. Uh, it's from the introduction in the book, 
And then after that, there's no more reading. This is more of a eye candy uh, book presentation. So what you'll see, uh, you'll see text on some of the slides. You feel free to read the text. Sometimes I don't read it. Uh, feel free to zone out on the beautiful pictures if, uh, if, if I'm gabbing too much. But uh, I'm just going to kind of tell you what, what's going on in the slide, certain parts of the slide. If I don't mention one part of the slide, ask me about it, and I'll talk about that too. Uh, so again, thank you for coming. And here we go. Welcome to Stencil Nation. And if you can't hear me, tell me to speak up. It's kind of an echoey gallery here. <clears throat> a newly discovered country exists without borders, leaders, and ironclad laws. Its citizens carry no official identification. The paint stains on clothes and hands or a camera for photographing an alley wall stand as informal documents of citizenship. This land has no military defense. Its only protection is a good hiding place for a piece of cutout material and a spray can and extra pairs of eyes looking out for police. To become a member of this nation, one only has to think up an idea, put it on a piece of paper or plastic, cut it out, and paint it somewhere. Another path to citizenship originates with those who appreciate the painted art, seek it out, document it, and enjoy a fresh alternative to mainstream urban culture. Since the 1970s, and maybe earlier, the ambiguous boundaries of this stencil nation have woven together into a unique early 21st century art form. With roots going back thousands of years, this body of people has finally united and together push and pull at the interpretations of graffiti, art, commerce, politics, and language. Unified via medium, yet with different visions, stencil artists and fans confront problems and complexities through a rich landscape of spray-painted possibilities. In cities, on the streets, the ironies and contradictions of our times are summed up in simple images, often with a bit of text, stirring emotions and begging questions. The artists of this nation work quietly, yet speak loudly from the dark urban landscapes. Their visions are sometimes accepted by the members of the cultural mainstream who may express interest by paying for a piece of a citizen's work. Galleries and museums have noticed the power of this community's voices and visions and their walls reflect their newly acquired tastes. Yet Stencil Nation continues to take the do-it-yourself ethic to heart and build unique community frameworks around a shared culture. These attempts to wall in and commodify the freeform nature of stencils continue to spread the grassroots concepts from which the art form originated. Stencil Nation, Graffiti, Community, and Art attempts to take these emotions and connections and share them with others who may or may not know about the art form. Artists, documenters, and fans from the communities present their own perspectives on stencil art offering insight and creativity that may help someone fall in love with the art of negative space while enriching appreciation for it as well. So thank you so much. Again, we're going to hop right into it. Stencil basics. Who here has made a stencil? Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Oh, good. Uh, well, you may know some of these things. <laughs> Reluctantly. Uh, you may know some of these things. Um, I just mentioned in the, in, uh, the introduction uh, some of the tips, so we'll get to that a couple of slides from now. Right now, I'm gonna, that's a photograph of Logan Hicks. He is the master of the photorealistic stencil. Uh, he just uh, finished Art Basel and sent me some great photographs today. Uh, he is standing behind his cutout stencil. That is that red lattice work that, that uh, is in the foreground of that photograph. So what exactly is a stencil? Yeah, that's, that's a lot of text there. Um, basically, it's three things. It's two nouns, and it's a verb. Uh, Logan is holding his stencil. That is a cutout piece of material right there. And basically, what he does when he uses it is he stencils. And what he makes when he uses it is a stencil. So to make a stencil, one will use a stencil to stencil a stencil. 
There are only uh, two, really two parts to the stencils. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell in uh, Logan's piece what, what the bridges are, but the bridges are the, the pieces of paper that are holding that image together. Uh, he's done an amazing job at uh, hiding the bridges. Um, some other work that you'll see throughout is you'll see pretty obviously these blank areas of uh, space on the wall or whatever, and that's where the bridges of paper are. And the bridges are holding together, holding together the islands, which are the negative space parts of the stencil. You can see Logan by looking through the negative space, looking through all those islands. And uh, again, uh, he does an amazing, beautiful job with that uh, pattern uh, showing the islands there. And then we'll go to some secondary words. This is a sidewalk stencil in San Francisco. The artist is a Claracuda Bandersnitch. Um, and basically what she did was she went out one night illegally with a spray can and a stencil. Uh, she had black spray paint and she got up on the sidewalks there or she was, went out riding. Those are some of the graffiti terms for when you go out to do graffiti in the city. And say the property owner doesn't like this piece for some reason, thinks it's offensive or, or just annoying, so the property owner would buff it. That is also what the government does as well when they eradicate graffiti. Uh, that's the term that we use. We just call it the buff or it got buffed. And then you see that kind of black haze over on the side. If you look at the lip, uh, if you look at the, the woman's lip and the stencil, it's kind of half painted. Obviously, she was doing it quickly since uh, she was doing it illegally. So she got a little overspray on that black fuzzy edge over there. So if uh, you've got your safari hat on and you're looking for stencils in the wild, one way to tell if it's definitely a stencil and not a screen print or a stamp or something else is uh, looking for that overspray. Drips, you'll see later, later in the presentation, uh, Klutz from Portland is uh, one of the masters of the drips. Uh, the artist that was featured in the Atlanta Journal, he uses uh, drips as well. That's a graffiti technique. And then these are a bunch of other terms that are used on the internet and in the community. Just so you know. So here's the slide, the one slide, how to make a cutout stencil. Uh, that is a stencil from Herzog in Italy. Uh, it's for a bike office, which is a bike co-op where you go and fix your bike for free. So what did he do? Step one, he thought up an idea. And the idea was very simple. He wanted a skull with a bike tool. Step two, what did he do? He drew it out on looks like a shelving paper, some kind of plastic piece of paper. And he got that X-Acto knife over there and he cut it out. And then of course, if you think islands and bridge, uh, you'll see the green, you see the green through the skull image showing the islands of negative space. And then as far as the bridge goes, he somehow decided not to do the bridge on the left-hand side of the skull. So he definitely would not take this out into the urban jungles to paint, it would fall apart. So step three, he got that roller instead and probably got some kind of ink. Uh, my guess is he was doing maybe posters or maybe fabric. And so he got the roller and he pushed that pigment through the negative space. And there you go, he created a stencil. It sounds easy, but as you'll see through all, throughout the presentation and, and in the book, uh, it, it does take a lot of practice to really figure out how to make a good stencil, especially if you're working with multi-layers and lots of colors or if you're going uh, modular like uh, M-City does, which we'll see later on. So again, I have a history degree in, in college and, and I was totally uh, intrigued by the history of the art form. Uh, it's all been kind of ad hoc. I've picked it up here and there. I've, I've had a couple of other books touch on the history or touch on bits and pieces of it. So in my book, I try to put it all together. Uh, I do have a four page chronology in the book uh, that really tries to tie it together with a little mini essay that I wrote. Stencils are really old. This is a 2,500 year old stencil wall in Argentina. This is not the oldest uh, example of stencil art on the planet. Uh, that goes much, much longer beyond this, uh, which we'll get to in a couple of slides. Um, but what I should tell you is uh, stencil, stencils, hand stencils like this on cave walls and stone walls started in three different continents uh, throughout the millennia, uh, first in Europe, and then in uh, Australia, and then in South America. 
and uh, with Australia doing boomerangs and axes as well. Uh, totally intriguing to me. Of course, this is prehistory, so no one really knows how the different people thought it up. No one really knows uh, what it was for. And then, of course, like most technology that we know of today, a lot of it started in China. Uh, these are some early Buddhist stencils from China, 10th century. Basically, they're itinerant Buddhist monks that uh, wandered around and they would paint temples and they would use stencils to create templates. Uh, they used a concept called stencil and pounce, uh, which uh, is still probably used in parts of the world today. And that's where you have a little bag of powder and you put the stencil on the wall and you tap the, the bag. And then when you pull the stencil off, you have this image that you can paint a template. And uh, luckily for Buddhist monks, uh, different uh, lives of uh, Buddha were used with different colors. So they could use the same piece in temples and they could paint them different colors to represent different Buddhas. It hopped into, it went to Japan after this. Uh, Japan uh, created a couple of different techniques. And then of course from Japan, once uh, the Westerners started uh, trading with Japan, it went to Europe. And uh, the peak of the European stencil style pretty much happened in the first 30 years of the 20th century in Paris, France. Uh, they called them Pouchois. And basically, it was a whole industry with at least 600 uh, employees making uh, one-of-a-kind books, stenciling books, stenciling wallpaper, stenciling all kinds of things. And they used 10, uh, uh, 10 stencils for the most part and easily replaced if they broke, easily repaired. None of these photographs, by the way, are in the book, uh, but they are in the chronology. And then we, we hop into the 20th century. Uh, talking about stencils as we know it, or as we think about it now in the 21st century. Uh, they do go all the way back to the early 20th century. As you see on the left, that is a poster from uh, uh, Arts Collective in the Soviet Union. Uh, at the time, there was a, the telegraph agency there was um, doing stencils, uh, or doing window poster series, and some of the artists in the group created stencils for that. And then we hop into the 1960s, which uh, kind of predates uh, stencils as we know it today and we have the San Francisco diggers doing that piece right there with the 1% free and then we have uh, Bear Osley who was the sound guy and the LSD chemist uh, with the Grateful Dead creating that first ever uh, Grateful Dead lightning bolt symbol with a stencil and then as way back as uh, the 1930s uh, protesting uh, Argentinian dictatorship uh, stencils have always been used as a voice of the voiceless in the streets uh, they are one of the tools in the toolbox for popular grassroots uprisings uh, all the way clear through to Chile in the 1980s and Poland in the 1980s, uh, even on to the present day, which we'll see later on in the presentation. And then some of the more influential stencil artists and stencils in the late 20th century that really uh, a lot of the artists today doing, doing it uh, looked back on. Uh, the Crass Collective uh, have one of the more famous stencils with their logo and uh, they used to go out after all their gigs when they were on tour in the 70s and they would just tag the streets, tag advertising with it. Anton Van Dalen and Bleck Larat uh, pretty much kind of started stenciling around the same time. Uh, Bleck Larat is pretty much the godfather of 21st century street stencils, so much so that uh, Banksy did his own rats uh, kind of as a homage to, to Bleck. Uh, Bleck is still stenciling today, and uh, once he did it, started doing it in Paris, there were literally all, almost overnight like two or three dozen people stenciling in Paris. And so where are those geographically? Like what countries? Uh, Krass is from the UK, uh, Anton Van Dalen's from New York City, Bleck is from Paris, and Seth Tabachman is from New York City. Seth Tabachman's uh, stencil is one of the more uh, famous stencils that uh, other people uh, you see it on patches and you see it in the streets. It's from World War III Illustrated. So just three slides of text from the chronology, some of which I've already spoken about. The first will show this photograph, which I got from National Geographic. That is a 35,000 year old stencil. Um, they carbon dated it to that. I have 30,000 years in my book, but I'll take National Geographic's word on it. Uh, and, and so read that uh, the first two lines, an ice age man or woman spray painted a wordless, I was here on that cave in France. Uh, 
think of that three-letter phrase that, that's in quotes because we're going to see that later on when we're talking about a different thing. So here's the text, the most text you're going to see for the whole presentation. Bullet points. Ah. Um, yes, I do have a four-page chronology. These are some of the things that are in it. Uh, you are maybe wondering why I have shadow puppets. Well, I was interested in what I call cousins of the stencil, cousins of the negative space. Um, there are other art forms that uh, try to push something through that negative space image. And again, starting in China, a very long time ago, we had shadow puppets. And here we go with more bullet points. Um, in the 1500s, a cut paper technique uh, started becoming popular in Europe. Of course, it came from China. Uh, that cut paper technique is now popularized today by artists like Kara Walker. Uh, again, it's a, a cutout uh, stencil is basically the cousin to uh, this technique as well. If uh, you snuck into a Kara Walker exhibit and spray painted the walls and didn't get arrested and then peeled her piece off the wall, that would be a nice little stencil. Uh, I was also interested in the technology that uh, stencil artists use today. Uh, where did that come from? So we see in the 1700s and 1800s, humans trying to pressurize uh, stuff inside of stuff. So there we go, trying to, trying to put carbonated beverages in glass. And then we see in 1899, they're, they're starting to figure out uh, gases and propellants uh, to uh, shoot stuff out of containers. But it wasn't until 1949, over there on the right bullet point, with Mr. Edward Seymour figuring out how to create spray paint. Uh, so all the graffiti writers today have Mr. Seymour to thank. Um, again, if you look on the left, in 1914, silt screen uh, is also a cousin to the stencil. Again, you're, push, you're using a squeegee and you're pushing ink through that negative space on the screen. And there you go. No more bullet points. Straight into the photographs. Uh, the aerosol pioneers. Again, uh, uh, Banksy started stenciling in 2002. Stenciling has a very long history going deep into the 20th century. Uh, but the street stencil as we know it began around the 1970s. John Fechner in the New York City area was one of the, the first artists in New York to really start doing it. He uh, basically wanted to do what he called single word poems uh, all around uh, really interesting places in uh, New York City. And at the time, most people, if you don't know this, at the time, there's huge swaths of New York were just destroyed, like piles and piles of rubble. And uh, so he got to find beautiful places of decay to uh, get his stencils up. He was also smart enough to photograph it. That's another thing. It's, uh, it was really hard when I was researching. I was trying to find uh, people that, that just uh, no one knows about or people that just don't have like representation in all the other stencil books that are out. And it was really hard. It was a lot of work. It was fun, but it was a lot of work. And then, of course, one of the contemporaries to Bleck, Jeff Arisol, uh, he, like a lot of artists, first saw stencils uh, really being used and popularized with uh, the punk movement. Uh, one of the, the things that punks did was uh, you take new clothes or you buy clothes at the thrift store, you just destroy it. You cut it up. You put, you put metal stuff on it. You put pins in it, and you stenciled it. So he saw the clash with stencils on their clothes. He was inspired. And then he saw Black doing his work. So he started getting up in France. And he still does today. This is a 2006 piece of his. This is a stencil on paper, uh, which is wheat pasted. So in the street art world, you call it a wheat paste or a paste up. And again, another punk influenced artist in San Francisco, Scott Williams. Uh, he started seeing it all around with punk bands advertising their, themselves or ripping up their clothes and stenciling their clothes. So Scott uh, picked up a knife, picked up the spray can, and became, as far as I know, one of the more obsessed artists. Um, he, all he does is paint and cut, paint and cut, make stencils. It's like 24-7. His house is covered uh, floor to ceiling with stencils. His bathroom's totally stenciled. His kitchen's completely stenciled. Um, this is a small piece. He doesn't use spray paint. Uh, spray paint's pretty dangerous. Uh, I recommend anyone using spray paint to take time and read the can. Uh, it's not good for you. He's, he's the poster child. He has a lot of health problems from his obsession, and so now he uses airbrush. Uh, this is an airbrush piece of his. 
He's still stenciling today. He does one-of-a-kind books, uh, which you can see on, uh, on my website, or you can go to bookland.org or .com and uh, look at photographs of his work. And then documenters. I actually have an aerosol pioneer who was photographing stencil art in the 1980s. Uh, not a lot of folks doing that back in the day. Um, D.S. Black, who's a librarian in San Francisco, uh, was nice enough to dig out all of his negatives and slides and borrow a scanner and scan them for me. Uh, I was, I'm still indebted to him. And then this is from the first Iraq War. Kind of uh, truthful today. So here we go, hopping into more photographs, more teaser photographs from the book. Hello. Hi. Uh, so these are so basically how I set up the slides for for this section uh, is two to the page alphabetically, and again. Um, each artist has like two to four pages, uh, if not other featured art, uh, here and there in the, in the book. So this first slide is, uh, I like this first slide, Adam 5100 and Amy Rice. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, the artists use the same tools but have very different visions. And here we go, like they use spray paint and cut out stencils to make their art and it couldn't get any different. Um, he's got this surreal uh, photographic style and she's got this beautiful, uh, poetic, uh, somewhat graphic novel style. And then this next slide uh, kind of gives you an example of how a lot of people uh, use the photorealistic style to a certain extent, um, like a simple kind of cartoon style. Uh, but Arafish, uh, he's unique in that uh, he went through a phase where he went into war zones to do stencil art, uh, under threat from sniper fire, under threat from military arrest. He did get arrested in Baghdad doing it. And while he was zip tied and tied up in the, in the truck, he had a tag on him that said um, insurgent graffiti. And I was informed by a journalist that I know who was there at the time that he was sprung out by a circus. Crazy circus uh, where he was, he was crashing in their house. Uh, they came and they showed up and they started juggling beer cans and they started making the guards laugh and go crazy and they got him out. Pretty cool. Banksy, I think everyone here probably knows who Banksy is. Does anyone not know who Banksy is? Yes, he is world famous. He is, I would say he's probably one of the more famous artists uh, of the 21st century if not since Andy Warhol. And moving on, Christine and Hal, uh, both uh, coming out of different backgrounds. Christine came out of this uh, hip hop uh, culture doing traditional graffiti in Baltimore, but he's always had this kind of popular uh, political angle on, on his art. So most of his stuff uh, has politics involved. Hal, uh, hardcore punk, since the beginning, since the 1980s, when he was making punk t-shirts with stencils, he keeps it real. He does not do gallery shows. All of his work is in the streets, and he does not use a computer. Janet Bike Girl and Clutch. Um, again, very different styles. Janet is obsessed with bicycle culture. Therefore, all of her bikes are about, I mean, all of her stencils are about bikes. Uh, she started off wanting to make a stencil for every bike model, and then when she found out that there were thousands of different bikes in the world throughout the decades, uh, her task has been dawning. Uh, Clutch, <laughs> Clutch, uh, master of drips, uh, the master of, uh, of using ornamental stencil art, uh, and also a pretty hardcore skater. Uh, he's, he's older than I am, but uh, he, he loves the skateboard and celebrates that in his art. And then here we go, Logan Hicks and M-City. Uh, two very different styles of art, but they both use modular stencils. Um, believe it or not, if you remember the photograph at the beginning of Logan, he uses, uh, with Logan Hicks uh, painting on the gallery wall, he uses little small stencils, and he'll do like maybe, say, like 10 stencils for a layer, and then he'll do 10 more stencils for the second layer, 10 more stencils for the third layer. M City, if you look at, if you look at the different little rectangles of the building, you'll see repetitive uh, stencils. Uh, M-City will show up with a stack of stencils and they'll build like a whole cityscape with them. Uh, we'll see in a slide here uh, down the road, we'll see a cityscape in the wild of theirs. In the book, they have two-page spreads that are pretty amazing. Pete Walliger and Pixnet, again, very different styles using the same tools and techniques. Uh, Pete's uh, got an amazing illustrative style, so all of his stuff, you could see it like a mile away down the street, you know it was his. Same thing with Pixnet. 
She's got this ornament, ornamental style that she uses. Uh, she calls them spores. She likes putting them out in the wild to beautify the concrete and asphalt uh, landscapes. Kim and the street art workers. The street art workers are not a group of stencil artists. It's more of an ad hoc group of artists that uh, will pick a, uh, a campaign. They'll choose a political topic, and then they'll put the call out to any artist to submit to the topic. Uh, a lot of stencil art does come uh, through. And then what they do when they get all the different artists' work is they collate it and then mail it back out to all the artists. So if I sent my art in, I would get maybe 20 different pieces of art, and then I could wheat paste it around my neighborhood or whatever. This was about uh, corporate controlled communication, clear channel. And then finally, Swoon and Tiago. Tiago, another outlaw cyclist who celebrates bicycle culture. Bicycles and stencils uh, just go hand in hand. I'm always on my bicycle looking for stencils. Um, I have a lot of stencil, uh, photographs of stencil art that I put in the book, just specifically because I like them both. And I could do that. And, uh, and then Swoon. Swoon's pretty much world famous. Uh, she's been collected by the Whitney and other big museums. Uh, she's more of the Kara Walker cutout style, but she has this very strong street art aesthetic. Uh, she likes wheat pasting the stuff on the wall in a way that it'll rot off or peel off. And then she accents her work a lot of times with stencils. She'll use the, the little red butterfly bird things, flower things, or stencils. So she does accent some of her work with stencil art. And then in my book, I celebrate the documentarians, the Stencil Nation citizens like me that, that fall in love with the uh, art of negative space and photograph it. Um, I'm very uh, humbled by the way that the, the internet boom has caused like many, many different people to enjoy photographing uh, the art form. And uh, some of them have been submitting to my website over the years, so I asked them if they'd like to be in the book, and of course they were very excited. David Drexler in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, he is a musician. He is, as far as I know, he's never made a stencil in his life. Uh, doesn't have any desire to, but he loves them. And he sends me photographs of dozens and dozens of, of stencils throughout the year, which are on the website. Uh, and then Duncan Cumming. Uh, he is a stencil artist, uh, but he is also one of the more prevalent uh, uh, documenters of Banksy's work out in the wild. And he's got a great website of all kinds of graffiti, uh, stencil graffiti and other kinds of graffiti. And uh, he was nice enough to give me some of his works, some of his photographs. And then we have Martin Reese who, in Toronto, who is a friend of Janet Bike Girl. Martin is not a stencil artist, but he is a professional photographer. Uh, therefore, uh, He's always got his camera, and once you start hanging out with a stencil artist or once you come to a presentation like this, you'll start noticing it everywhere if you haven't noticed it already. Uh, Martin has his camera, so Martin started snapping photographs around Toronto and whenever he traveled and became a fan of the art form. Same thing with Maya. Maya, as far as I know, she's got a full-time day job. Uh, she loves photographing stencils. Uh, she became such a fan that she started traveling around Europe where she, she lived. She started traveling around Europe specifically to go to cities that had a lot of stencil art. And then she started meeting artists through the internet and she started uh, hanging out with the artists through the internet. Never made a stencil in her life. Loves photographing them. And then finally in the documentarians section, Thomas Mueller, who is a stencil artist in Hamburg. There's quite a little small scene in Hamburg. There's a community of uh, artists that like to uh, uh, do stencil work. And he, again, loves to photograph it. He has a great collection on his website, mostly of Hamburg stencils, which there are like hundreds. He gives me, he dumps like dozens and dozens to me for stencilarchive.org. And uh, he also looks for them when he travels. I look for them when I travel, too. It's a fun thing to do. Community. So uh, again, uh, continuing the table of contents in the book, uh, I have a section on uh, community because the subtitle of my book, Graffiti, Community, and Art, uh, I, 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 stencils come from a very different background than traditional graffiti. Traditional graffiti uh, is, uh, is generally thought of as combative. Uh, you have walls that you protect. Uh, you have battles. Uh, you go other, if you have uh, a beef with somebody, you go, you totally destroy them all over the city. Um, they, they in turn destroy you. Sometimes fist fights break out. 
you don't really get that in the stencil world. Uh, again, stencils come from uh, the punk scene. Uh, they come from grassroots uh, political scene. Uh, so there's a lot of community around it. Uh, one of the first instances of public community back in the 30s was a Mexican muralist in Argentina getting Argentinians uh, together to do stencils illegally in the streets protesting a dictatorship, creating community. Banksy did a show in London, which happened before the book came out, uh, which is unfortunate because this was one of the more ultimate examples of community. It's called the Cannes Festival. And basically what he did was he went in and he set up, uh, he set up installations, he did murals, uh, and then Banksy left, of course, no one knows who he is technically. And then all these A-list uh, stencil artists came in and did big mural pieces. And then it was open to the public. And then the public got to hit the walls. They got to do stencils on the walls. They had a few rules to go by. One rule, of course, is you can't go over someone else's art. And as, if you look at my book, as you'll see, is um, uh, stencils tend to create, uh, they tend to communicate, they tend to create a narrative as opposed to going over each other and battling like who's better and which one's on top. So as you can see in these crazy photographs, it's all about creating the story, the, the stencil narrative. That's a M-City piece right there at the bulldozer. Yeah, so this was pretty sick. I was on Flickr looking at the Cannes Festival photographs after the book went to press. It was just like totally sick. This is amazing. And then a couple of weeks ago when I was on tour up in the Northeast, I got a, a PDF magazine from Romania of all places, all about stencil art in English. And uh, I decided to put this slide in here to give you another example of community that's not in the book. A Camp 2008, 90 people joined forces to achieve the highest draft anime stencils ever. I totally rocked. I like that. And then you have like these great photographs of these people. Uh, there's like, what, like four or five people spray painting that stencil right there in Romania. I, I've since chatted with the guy that made the magazine and, uh, and he told me that they're about, they're, they're like thousands of people that love anime in Romania. He's like, it's a huge thing. I was like, oh, okay. In the book is a show that I did back in 2003 called The Art of Negative Spaces. I co-curated with a guy named Stephen Lambert. And uh, basically what we tried to do was have as many artists as possible on the walls, have a silent auction, sell the art as cheap as possible so people could walk away with uh, budget art. We had a collaborative mural. We had a table where you could uh, get a piece of paper, draw out an image, get an X-Acto knife, cut it out. And then you could go over to a buff phone booth and you could put it on the buff phone booth. Uh, the sidewalks were free reign. It was a lot of fun. Uh, again, again, my website was very young. There, um, Stencil Revolution, which is a huge website based out of Australia, was pretty young. So every, everyone in the community internationally was just starting to find each other out. Um, so Melbourne had been doing stencil shows and stencil community events for about a year before this. Uh, but this is really the first instance in North America that I know of where we got together. Clutch who was in the Negative Spaces show was very inspired by people getting together and having such a good time that he started a, a, a thing called Vinyl Killers, which is basically you find the uh, record on the street in the gutter that somebody threw out and you get spray paint, kill it, and submit it. And if you look at the quote in the bottom, it was the perfect vehicle to bring everyone together and showcase stenciling as an art form. So he was all about bringing people together. And uh, he's since done seven Vinyl Killers shows. And now he's changed the rules a little bit. It's not just stencils. You can do other artwork on it. And then just last year in Barcelona, which at the time was a really hot spot for street art and, and stenciling, uh, it is no longer because the mayor, the new mayor there does not like graffiti. Uh, a group of folks took over a community art center and created Diffuser Stencil Festival. And if you look in the text below, they had talks, video screenings, and workshops. But again, the highlights were the collaborative murals that were all over the community art center and the neighborhood. And then finally, I'll finish with this other crazy photograph at Cannes Festival. <laughs> I could stare at that all day. If I had a camera, if I was there with a camera, I probably would have passed out. It's like, what do you photograph? How do you photograph it? I don't know. So uh, the rest of the book, pretty much a lot of it is, is mostly stencil graffiti. But uh, when I'm in public like this, talking to people about it, creating a dialogue and making people think, this section is called, What is Art?
because as I have found, especially when journalists call, uh, call me to, to talk to me, I've found that graffiti is kind of a hot word and the fact that it's illegal and without permission is kind of a, kind of a button to push. So I, I, when I was writing the mini essay for this section uh, earlier this year, you know, I was very interested, like, like, well, what exactly is art? So in this section, I'll give you a couple of examples. What's art? Depends on who you ask, of course. And these two photographs could very well plainly like, make you think, like, what is art? Like the Nemo piece, that's uh, in Paris, France. It's beautiful. If I walked out of my house and saw that, you know, I'd be like, oh, that's great. Oh, look at that. I might keep that. But what if you walk out of your house and you see this overtly political one color street stencil with uh, Rumsfeld making Gitmo prisoners disco? What if you're totally offended by that? What if you hate it? I mean, what if it's like, you know, it's crap. You know, it's on the sidewalk. No one puts art on the sidewalk. Or do they? I don't know. Uh, as I was working on the, the text for this section, uh, I had these two images in mind um, because basically the conclusion I came to was it doesn't matter whether or not graffiti is art. Humans, for 35,000 years at least, humans have always had this disposition to say, I am here, which is what National Geographic supported me on, uh, as did this book uh, of Argentinian stencils. That's where the quote is in the bottom. So this is an uh, alleyway in Melbourne, Australia. Um, again, cities think of, think of graffiti differently. Uh, in Melbourne, uh, 100,000 people a year travel to Melbourne to photograph the alleyways, to photograph the graffiti. Um, it's beautiful. There are, just, there are dozens of alleys that are like this, just all over the city. You, I, you know, I had a borrowed bicycle when I was there in August, and I just wandered around just seeing this everywhere. Uh, but if I pulled out a spray can and wanted to add to it, and a policeman saw me, that would be a $500 fine. Having that one spray can would be a $500 fine. So you're welcome to, to fly to Melbourne and look at it and photograph it, but no one can make it. Kind of weird. Uh, right now, Berlin is a hot spot for street art. Berlin, Berlin just has kind of this open attitude about it, and it's, from what I, everybody tells me over and over, it's everywhere. Uh, the same goes with Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, they have way more, the police have way more thing, uh, important things to deal with, especially in the favelas. Uh, so. Uh, the murals and the street art in Brazil, from what I understand, is just totally all over the place. And then, of course, Banksy, who does not consider himself an artist. He calls himself a vandal. Banksy has an opinion about what art is. So much so that that's him over on the right photograph. So much so he dressed up like a dowager in an overcoat and a fake beard. And he went into all the major museums in the, in the North Hemisphere, France, uh, in Paris, London, in New York City, and he put his own art up, basically protesting uh, the, capture, the captured nature, the, you know, the, the encaged nature of uh, museums and galleries. And then finally, making you think a little further about what is art, uh, this piece here on the left, this uh, no parking sign right around the corner from my house in the Mission District in San Francisco. I, photograph, I took that photograph, and then maybe two weeks later, that sign was gone. My only estimation is uh, the person that saw that sign and had the screws to, had a screwdriver to take it out, probably wanted to hang it on his wall. So here we go, no parking sign that is art. How interesting. And then uh, finally uh, for this section, uh, Boxy from Germany uh, loves playing with the buff. He's got a lot of very funny uh, photographs of the buff, uh, a couple of which are in my book. And so he has uh, the quick tag right there, the spray paint bubble letters in the right, top right. So he did that, and then he stenciled the government worker buffing it, and then he, and then he buffed it all, <laughs> which is pretty funny. You know. And again, making you think about the buff and thinking about art. And of course, uh, I also talk about in this essay the buff as art as well. Uh, painting over stuff uh, has its own artistic aesthetic to it. So different themes on the streets, stencil graffiti. I tried to break it down differently from uh, all the other stencil books that are out there, which I have in my bibliography in the back of the book. Uh, I'm interested in the way people interact with stencils or in the way stencils tell you to interact. So we have buff covered, crossed, and ripped. Uh, someone didn't like the gay shame stencil, so they got their wax pencil out and broke the law by drawing a big X over it. Could have been a property owner that just didn't have a bucket of paint. I don't know. 
And then we have conversations. Again, I'm, uh, I, I see uh, the art on the walls outside as a, as a very rich narrative, as a historical document, uh, telling me stories uh, from, from totally random, mysterious places. Uh, some of them actually want you to get involved. Uh, there are some, with dance, some stencils have dance steps. Uh, the, the red stencil on the left is from a story that came out two Julys ago in San Francisco. Uh, the artists were called The Strangers. The story was called She Loves the Moon. It was a 52 stencil story about a woman that breaks up with her boyfriend because she fell in love with the moon. It has four endings. A lot of the stencils have arrows telling you to go left, to go straight, to go left or straight. Uh, if, you go, if you choose one, you have to follow it to the bitter end, and then you have to go back and, and figure out a different route. Uh, I, I got so kind of frenzied, I spent three days following them around, I, I ended up making a map, and you know, I was like, ah, oh, this is when I need GPS to know like, which one I did. Uh, a lot of them got painted over almost instantly, so you lost kind of part of the story, which was unfortunate. But again, conversations and interactions on the street. And then there are two ways you find stencils in the urban jungles. You find them horizontal on the sidewalks. San Francisco is the hot spot for that uh, style. New York does it too. And then vertical. Most of, the, most of the planet does vertical on walls. And then the next section in the book are the cities of stencil nations. Uh, for the slide presentation, I call this the psychogeography uh, portion. Why psychogeography? There's all that text explaining why. Actually, all you need to know is the end. It's uh, anything that takes pedestrians off their predictable paths and jolts them into a new awareness of the urban landscape. Uh, psychogeography is a term that came out of the 1960s in Paris uh, and in France. Situationists did, uh, thought it up. And basically, it was like, uh, get out of your rut. Get out of your groove. If you have the same commute every day, why don't you take that one alleyway left to go around the block to your subway stop? And why don't you look at stencil art, look for graffiti. At least that's what I think. So here are some of the cities in alphabetical order. Black Rock City, which is Burning Man. Believe it or not, Burning Man has a graffiti problem. Uh, everything's permission-based out there. They have a whole page of rules if you, if you ever think about going. One of the rules is don't tag other people's art. Well, that's graffiti, so that's out there. And whenever I go, I bring my camera, and I always come back with a lot of fun photographs. Jump in the shark. Montreal, I try to uh, feature smaller cities of stencil nation. Montreal is one of them. Pretty fun scene going on there. And then continuing that uh, 1930s tradition of popular grassroots uprisings. In Oaxaca, a couple of years ago, uh, the teachers union walked out against the governor. And all the, all the people of the, of the state followed. Uh, it was a long occupation. Uh, there were people that were murdered during it. And of course, groups got together, made stencils, and got up on the streets. And then, of course, I had to feature San Francisco, my home city. That's a swoon piece right there that's uh, about four years old, long gone. I had to put a second slide in because it's San Francisco, of course. Uh, the Abraham Lincoln photograph is from around 1997. It is still there, uh, slowly fading away. Uh, it's on a hill where no one really walks. So uh, if, if you're interested, it's Liberty and Guerrero Streets in the Mission District. Come on out and check it out. And then I also wanted to feature Asia. Uh, fortunately for me, Flickr, I found ph photographers on Flickr that had Asian stencil art. And they were nice enough to be in the book. And then clear across the other side of Asia, uh, Israel has a pretty healthy stencil scene. Um, the wall in Palestine is definitely uh, target number one for many, many artists like Banksy and Swoon and many other artists. But I was surprised in Tel Aviv uh, that there was like uh, just blocks and blocks of, of very amazing, fun stencil art. And then finally, for our psychogeography tour, two anti-capitalist examples from Tokyo, another Asian city. So we're getting to the end of the presentation and the end of the book. Uh, before we start with the stencil media, uh, there's about 15,000 words in the book. If you haven't seen the book, I have a little mini essays for a lot of the sections, and then I have a bibliography. And then I had the artists give me tips, uh, which I put in there. And then I had uh, documenters and artists talk about their art and tell me what they love about stencils. 
Um, not many stencil books have featured the cutout stencils themselves, so I have a uh, good four pages, I think, in the book. That's a Scott Williams stencil over there on the left, totally hand-drawn with a pencil, and it probably took him about three days to figure out how to cut that insanity out. And another slide of cutouts. That's a Jeff Arasaw piece right there. Uh, you can look through the hair and see the trees in his backyard. Another example of that island of negative space. More things people stencil upon fabric. You can get very intricate and, and uh, stylish like Zavi did on the right, or you can just do a basic street stencil on a flag and take it to a protest. And then another one, which is a fun section in the book, stencil on, stencils on found objects. If you can't read Julie Shields' stencil on the armchair, it says it's never as bad as it seems. <laughs> uh, she kind of she kind of took John Fechner's uh, style and went around uh, and found uh, junk furniture in her Melbourne neighborhood and put really funny things on the furniture. It's hard, but you can go large with stencils. That's me standing there by the Emma Goldman piece. Uh, those are both in San Francisco, and they're both gone. They were both painted. Uh, well, the Emma piece was like, has like tons of gravel over it. It's in an industrial area of the city. If you're going to do stencils large illegally, be careful. I, I, come to me. Maybe I can give you tips. I really don't know how you can do big, big, easy, and safe one stencils on. Huh? One day at a time. One day at a time. Yeah, do a layer, come back. Next day, do a layer. Uh, stencils on paper, again, I've showed you uh, examples of wheat paste stencils. I have a whole section of that in the book. And then uh, with vinyl killers, you get photographs of walls, but with stencils on vinyl, you get one per photograph. Spray paint and vinyl, it's an amazing combination. Vinyl loves spray paint, just so anybody knows if you ever want to spray paint something. And it's got the hole in the middle that you can screw it on the wall really easy. Stencils on stickers, if uh, the buff is on in your city, you can go small. You can do small, tiny stencil stickers. There's a band here in the city called Lee Harvey Oswald, and they've got the ski mask icon. And I've, I've been wandering around looking for stencils the last couple of days, and it's everywhere. But it's so easy, you know, you just give a dude a stack of stencils. Stick, stick, stick. And then finally, stencils on wooden canvas. Uh, this, this section was initially just stencils on wood, but uh, this uh, photograph on the right of the policewoman was submitted to me by a 14-year-old named Nils who lives in the Baltimore area. I was very impressed by his skills and his enthusiasm for the art form. I saw him as basically the next generation of Stencil Nation. So I changed, changed, the, section, changed the section to include his photograph specifically. And uh, I'll end the slide presentation with uh, his top five tips that are also in the book in that tips area. And uh, it's pretty funny. Again, he's 15 now, but again, this was coming from a 14-year-old earlier this year. So this is, these are Neil's tips. Tip number one, draw a stencil every day. And for anyone who has made a stencil, man, that's a, that's, that's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> tip number two, and this is my favorite, don't listen to your parents. They'll understand eventually. <laughs> uh, I was uh, in the D.C. area reading these tips out, and of course his father walked in right when I read that. <laughs> And Nils came up to me and he was like, thanks, man, you just pissed my dad off. <laughs> Sorry. Tip number three, you don't need fancy ass paint to be an artist. Uh, that is very true. If you definitely want to learn how to do stencils and get into spray paint art, uh, start with the cheap paint first. Uh, you, you can go to a whole new level with the, with the really good paint, but you don't need it. And tip number four, which uh, if anybody wants a homework assignment today, tip number four, look for graffiti. That's a pretty easy thing to do, especially if you're stuck in traffic in your car. Just start staring at the street signs and the newspaper boxes or the, the nooks and crannies of the buildings. And then finally, step number five, and this might be a homework uh, assignment for any of you as well. Try to imagine things as stencils. So there you go. Thanks for coming. Questions?